everyone, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will be your driver on this journey. Uh, tonight, I want to talk about uh, a very fun part of chess, which is attacking, specifically attacking the king. Um, and I wanted to do this lecture uh, for a number of reasons, but one of them is always, I'm, uh, you know, the, uh, the person who is always complaining about the stupid gambits that everybody makes YouTube videos about. The Stafford gambit, the whatever gambit, the Halloween gambit, the Frankenstein Dracula, the monster, the monstrosities of chess that are on YouTube these days. Um, and those gambits will often lead to some very fun games where you checkmate the, the opponent's king right out of the opening. Um, but the best attacking games, uh, in my opinion, happen after the opening. And so I want to talk about some common ideas, some common attacking themes to look for in your games, specifically against the, the castled kings. So your opponent has survived the opening, gotten castled, has a normal looking position, but still you can crack it open and attack that king. You can have fun in chess without playing the Stafford Gambit, I promise. Firing shots at Rosen, Rosen, Jonathan, everybody. I hit everybody. Um, <laughs> Just kidding, they're all great. Watch their, watch their videos. Anyways, in our first game, we have Yuri Razavayev with white against Ivan Farago. Uh, and we're gonna start with a queen's gambit. We get knight f6, knight c3, and c5. So we're in the tarash. Uh, there are a number of ways to deal with the tarash, but white chooses to take on d5. Uh, black plays knight takes d5 rather than e takes d5. I think both are, are playable. And white responds with e3. We get knight c6, uh, bishop to c4 is an interesting idea. Uh, we don't really want to interfere with this queen's access to d4 just yet, and we'll see that pressuring this knight does have some advantages. Uh, c takes d4, and then white, of course, responds with e takes d4, rather than knight takes d4. So we have gotten into the all-time classic IQP, isolated queen's pawn. Uh, so of course, this uh, type of position can show up in a number of different openings, both e4 and d4. Uh, there's sort of a, a, this is one of the most common positions to get in chess, one of the most common structures. White has the queen's pawn that is isolated, and black is fortified against it, trying to blockade it, trying to pressure that isolated pawn, but will suffer from a slight lack of space. So let's play a couple more moves. Black plays bishop e7. White castles and black castles. Uh, and now, right out of the opening, just let's test your IQP knowledge. What do you think white should be aiming for in this position? What, what kind of ideas are coming to mind? <clears throat> How are we going to finish development and, and start to have a more concrete plan? Any ideas? Okay, someone says SE5. I think S means knight. Um, so yeah, knight E5 is, is one of the ideas. Trying to take advantage of uh, this extra space that, that the D-pawn gives us, but I'm more interested in you know a, a bigger plan. Like why, why are we putting our knight on E5? Why are we doing anything? What is, what is our goal in this position? What is our goal here? How are we supposed to use this extra space to our advantage? OK, the chat's just giving some, some moves. Uh, Trent says rookie one. Uh, David is set on 95. Trent also says 94. but. You're not answering my question. What is our goal? Okay, Gabriel says to push the pawn. So that's one of the ideas that uh, will crop up in, in isolated queen pawns. Sometimes white tries to play for this move d5. And with d5, we're going to trade off our weak pawn. 
while still enjoying a lot of the advantages of the space that it gave us. Our pieces would be better placed. We can try to rip things open some more and uh, attack once we, we've opened things up over there. But d5 actually isn't going to be our, our main idea in this instance. And the reason is pretty simple. Black is controlling the d5 square very, very adequately. There's, there's not much we can do to really force black off of this d5 square. And black is even going to going to continue with stuff like b6 and bishop b7 to further solidify this square. So uh, although pushing the isolated pawn is often a, a good idea, that's not really going to be our goal in, in this position. <clears throat> James Duggan asks, is this a pan of Botvinnik attack? Uh, this one specifically is not, but I think you can get this exact position in the pan of Botvinnik. Like I said, there's a number of ways to get to, uh, get to these positions. <clears throat> James says, try a3, bishop a2, bishop b1. So that's more of what I was looking for. So uh, why would we do such a maneuver? Well, of course, the goal is to attack on the king's side. This is one of the super common ideas in uh, isolated queen pawn positions, is you want to somehow launch an attack on the king's side uh, because that's what you can do when you have more space. You can easily switch between different sides of the board. And in this case, White has these long open diagonals looking at Black's king, and this knight over here is ready to help, our queen is ready to help, and we'll see that we can even bring more pieces in into the attack. So one of the really important ideas here is going to be attacking on the king's side for White. Now I actually don't like the move that White played in the game, which was bishop d3. It's a very straightforward move, but it's sort of missing the point of why we put the bishop on c4 in the first place. So. Uh, before we move on with this idea of trying to attack on the king's side, I first want to just say rookie one is, is the normal move. It's the main move. This is still a theoretical position um, rather than bishop d3. But I'm curious if you guys can tell me the reason. Why would we rather play rookie one than bishop d3? What is the point of having this bishop on c4? What is the point? Any ideas in person audience? <laughs> no? OK. Mm -mm. So what does the bishop do on c4? What is it doing here? Pressuring d5. Yeah, it's pressuring d5. So, so why does that matter? Why do we need to have some pressure on d5 here? OK, so we, we still have e5 pretty much under control. Like it, It's going to be difficult for black to play this move. And rookie one kind of achieves that same aim anyways. Um, more importantly, though, black has to finish development. And to finish development, we need to put this bishop somewhere. And so because we have these two attackers on d5, if black tries to commit to something like b6 in this position, for example, I think we are actually just taking on d5. And the point is, we've induced this weakness on the queen side. And since our bishop is here to back up our knight, queen takes d5 isn't playable, e takes d5 must be played, and then this bishop is no longer able to develop to this diagonal. So kind of an opening subtlety there, but it's important to understand you know, why we're putting these pieces on these squares. Um, because if you don't understand this idea, then bishop c4 just sort of feels, feels wrong. You know, Why not just bring the bishop to the better square? But it's with an idea, which is why I was sort of surprised to see bishop d3 in the game, sort of missing the point. Um, and then black right away misses the point back. So the main line goes rook e1, and because white has this idea of taking on d5 against b6, black generally takes on c3 first to get rid of this idea, and then plays b6 to develop. Um, so of course, naturally, what is the best move after bishop to d3? What should black be doing here? <clears throat> hello, hello to Manny. Also, yeah, welcome back, everybody, to, to the Road to 2000. I, uh, I was off for a couple weeks there with COVID, but I'm recovered now. I'm safe. I'm back in society. So it's, it's good to be back. <clears throat> yeah, you can just play b6. And I think b6 is the best move. Um, and the reason is, now if takes, quite happy to take back with the queen. We have not locked in. We have not locked ourselves in on this diagonal, and black is actually going to have some pretty significant pressure against white's king. 
So some opening subtleties there that were, were maybe missed. Um, what I suspect happened is both players had this position in their preparation. And when white played bishop d3, uh, both players were like, I can get to the position that's in my preparation. So they just did it anyways, even though it's technically not you know, the objective best move. So takes on c3 was played anyways, even though now there's really no need to. And then b6, and then rook e1, and we've transposed to the main line. Uh, so this is a pretty significant change in structure, uh, and it's actually a favorable one for white in most instances. Sometimes black can claim that this structure is worse than just having the isolated pawn because there are two pawns on these open, open files, uh, especially if black is able to, for example, uh, set up a blockade on these light squares and use the squares in front of the pawns for, uh, for outposts for his pieces. Uh, however, there's one massive advantage to having this pawn on c3. And you can probably guess what it is. It's, it's that this pawn defends your formerly weak pawn on d4. So now, again, there are multiple ideas in the position for white. Um, let's just play one more move. Bishop b7. This was expected. Uh, there are multiple ideas here. One of them is this idea of pushing the hanging pawns, is what they're called. It's the hanging pawn structure. You can push them forward and try to break through by playing d5 or playing c5 and trying to just push your pawn. Uh, but I don't think that's actually the best plan here. Uh, it might not seem like it from this position, but black's king is actually going to be very, very weak in this position. And there's one big reason for it, which is going to be a big theme throughout the lecture, and that reason is there's, there's no knight on f6. The knight on f6 is a really key defender of the castled king, on the king's side especially. And without this knight here, already you can start to think, hey, maybe these, these pawns are a little bit weak. Maybe we can set something up and attack on, on the king's side. So after bishop b7, you might expect some kind of normal move, maybe even like bishop b2, c4, rook c1, queen c2. Uh, these sort of long-term plans just to play the position slowly. But white had a, a very nice idea in this game that proved to be uh, rather difficult for, for black to meet. So what do you think white came up with here? White to move and launch a kingside attack. Rookie four. Okay, rookie four is bold. Rookie four is bold. Um, the problem, I think, with this move is uh, the h4 square is, is going to be guarded. And you can come to g4, but... Uh, it's not quite working fully in tandem with, with the rest of your pieces. It, it, it does bring in another attacker, though. Webster says g4. We'll keep this rookie 4 idea in mind, though, because this is going to be important. So we've got two ideas, rookie 4, g4. h4. Um, and Manny is talking about playing on the queen side, as is somebody else. Um, uh, okay, you guys are, are very, very direct. This is, this is sort of what's called hope chess. So you, you don't want to play a4, bishop a3, hoping for bishop a, uh, hoping for bishop takes a3, rook takes a3, and then the Greek gift, because that takes you four moves, and it takes black one move to stop the Greek gift, and so then he'll, he'll play three useful moves in the meantime, and then you're in trouble. <clears throat> OK, bishop b1 is, on, is suggested, as is bishop c2, with the, the idea of making the battery. Um, just bishop takes h7, just do it, just get them, uh, also suggested. So uh, there's a lot of ideas. So how do we uh, sort of sift through these ideas? Well, uh, what our goal is here is, yes, it's to attack the king. Um, but also very importantly, when black's three pawns have not moved on the king's side, they're actually very solid. It's tough to sort of break up this structure uh, and sort of get checkmate. And the reason for that is they're very fluid. You know, white, black might move this f pawn, black might move this g pawn, black might move this h pawn, depending on the, the threats that we make. So our, our goal kind of first is to, yes, make threats and try to checkmate, but it's also to induce these pawns to move so that there are more weaknesses in the position. So that's why I think rookie four, for example, isn't going to be good enough because rook e4, rook g4, uh, then you are threatening bishop h6. Uh, but it's still difficult to, to say how that, that 
how that is going to provoke a weakness. For example, let's say rook e4, rook e8, rook g4, bishop f8, bishop h6. Um, I might already be playing just g6, trading off these bishops and developing and sort of defending adequately. Like, you can induce g6 with this plan, but black is able to guard these dark squares with this dark squared bishop. So we have to find some other way to force black to make concessions on the king's side. Force these pawns to move so that we can weaken them, we can soften them, and then, uh, and then crash through. Uh, Trent says the slow g3, h4, and Webster says g4. So talked a little bit about rook e4. Rook e4 is sort of a, a normal looking move to activate the rook, but again, it's a little bit slow, and it's only inducing g6, which black can sort of defend bishop f6 to g7, bishop f8, things like that. Uh, g4, I don't really understand the point of at all. I, I don't see how this is really advancing the attack. Uh, you know, like g5, h4, h5, g6 is maybe an idea, but that, that pawn might end up actually in, in your own way. Uh, outside of that, you can't just be totally blind to your opponent as well. Uh, black is getting very much ready to sort of crush you on this diagonal, right? This is sort of scary stuff if you start moving the g-pawn. So same issues with g3 on this diagonal. It is also just a little bit slow. Uh, and as far as bishop b1 or bishop c2 and queen d3, uh, this might be playable, but you might find that your queen is better placed on d1 than it is on d3. And the reason for that is this queen can uh, very actively jump into the, into the, into the king's side. And if you spend your time uh, doing something like this after g6 again, uh, now you might find that your queen is a little bit stuck over here. It, it can't actually make its way effectively into the king's side without spending some more time. So what does that leave? I think the only one I didn't mention now is h4. And h4 is the correct answer here. This move, uh, kind of surprisingly, is really, really strong. I think white is already significantly better in this position. Uh, so let me ask the obvious. Oh, OK, one more idea. Kenroy Davis says queen c2. Queen c2 is a perfectly fine move. This is the main alternative. If you're not going to go for you know, crazy attack h4, you can play queen c2, uh, pressure this guy just a little bit. And for example, after something like g6, we are going to get these ideas that I talked about, where black is surviving on the king's side because this bishop can come defend some of these loose squares. Uh, with h4, that's going to be a little bit harder for black to, to maintain. So let's ask the obvious question. Uh, what happens if black captures our pawn for free and then we're down a pawn? So sad. What happens here? What were we up to with this h4 move? Yeah, so definitely we want to take this dark squared bishop. And we can arrive at that conclusion pretty quickly, right? In all these lines we're looking at, g6, this bishop is coming back to defend black's king and sort of stymieing our attack. So h4 takes, uh, for example, knight takes is already a, a huge win for us. Because now if g6 gets played, black has you know big trouble, big trouble. This bishop is going to come invade. And we're going to try to play for mate on, on the dark squares. So I'm sure you guys have seen this before. You never want to play g6 when you don't have the dark squared bishop, and white does have the dark squared bishop, because you, know, you just sort of get demolished like this. Um, but we actually do have a better move than rook e4. Um, yeah, just rook e3. And this is just uh, incredibly dangerous now for black. Uh, immediately, we have this threat to like, win the game with checks. Um, which, if you haven't seen this checkmating pattern before, just to show it off here. Um, check, check, and rook h8, amazing. Queen h5, queen h7. There you go. Uh, so big threats already with rook e3, big threats. So what is black going to do? Well, it's finally time black has to make a concession on, on the king's side. We have to play g6 or h6. If you play h6 here, um, 
I think, again, you're just going to be in big trouble. Rook h3, for example, queen g4. And this is very, very difficult to, uh, to stop. Very difficult to stop. Uh, just one more example line. Uh, that's a free queen. There you go. Amazing. Hold for applause. OK. <laughs> um, uh, of course, you know this pin on the, on, on the file is enough to win here. And if you don't unpin, I'm going to take this next turn. And same checkmate as before. Uh, check, 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 check. So really dangerous stuff, which is why black should play g6 here. But after g6, uh, white is again just going to be crushing on the dark squares like we talked about. Rook h3 looks very tempting. There's actually a better move in rook g3. And the point is, it achieves the same aim, makes this queen move. Because if the queen doesn't move, again, you're going to find yourself trapped. Um, and so after something like queen e7, we just play bishop g5, bishop h6, queen h5. And uh, this is coming very, very quickly. Uh, for example, f5 to stop it, we just bring in the rook, bishop c4. Like The, the moves sort of play themselves at this point. And you know, then you can sack and, and calculate to your heart's desire. But you don't necessarily even need to, to sacrifice here. For example, queen h4, rook e3, and, and you just are, are going to win this game. And I believe this, is, this has been played before. Yeah, it, in some random game from the 90s, white played bishop f4 here and, and won very, very easily. Uh, but rook g6 is good enough, if, if you're curious. So taking an h4, not so good. Not so good. You get into quite a lot of trouble with this nice move, rook e3, heading to g3, and, and causing all sorts of problems. One last thing to look at, if black plays something like uh, queen f6, we just go rook h3. And we've seen this position uh, before, I think. Or queen g4, and we've seen this position before with all the same problems. Um, so bishop h4, not looking so good. Not looking so good. And now, to play h4, do you need to calculate all that? Uh, I'm going to say no. And you don't even need to have this like in your opening prep. So how do you come up with a move like h4 and actually play it in your game? Well, you look at all these lines, like queen c2, g6, bishop h6, and you start to think to yourself, man, this, this bishop is, is really just preventing all of my play by, by coming back to f8 and defending. Um, and so you start to think, well, how can I get rid of this bishop? And you start to think, OK, maybe h4, and I'm coming into to g5. And if black takes an h4, I'm getting rid of this bishop. And then you start calculating a little bit. You find rook e3. You see some of these lines. And then you, you go from there and, and attack. So of course, there is the question, uh, what happens if black does not take the pawn, which is what we're going to look at now, which is knight to a5. Um, this is the move that uh, Farago played in the game. But it's just not very good. It's sort of taking the positional approach to now a very, very severe threat on, on the king's side. Right, uh, Ivan is playing his positional chess. He's going to go rook c8, build his nice little blockade on the queen side. But it's not going to matter if, if the king is dead. Um, just for reference, I think the only move that I looked at that I was satisfied wasn't totally lost was queen d5. And this was actually Jan Timmons' choice in a game against uh, Vichy Anand. And it looks very dangerous for black still. And in fact, black did go on to lose this game against Anand. But at least it wasn't to checkmate. Anand you know, did some funny business on the queen's side, and then eventually did do things like a4, and ended up switching, switching ideas, playing on the queen's side. Uh, so I wanted to throw that move out. But knight a5 is our move in the game. Of course, what's our follow-up to h4? We played h4 not necessarily to play h5, h6, when again, our own pawn kind of gets in the way, but to play knight g5, the idea that everybody, uh, everybody loves. Now, the Greek gift isn't actually going to be quite uh, as good here, because after knight g5, we can take, and you don't have a rook on h1 to finish the checkmate. But thankfully, knight g5 itself is a pretty good move. OK, so we play knight g5. Uh, you know, Big whoop. We have attacked uh, on the king side and are now inducing a weakness, either g6 or, or h6. So what is our point against the move g6? What, what ideas come to mind here? How, what are some themes to, uh, to break down this structure? Just sack. Just sack. Just sack at all, right? So how do we want to sack? I want to sack on h6. OK, it takes. Queen h7. King g8. Otherwise, I get checked on h6. Bishop 
Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. You sack it all. Um, and white's just winning here. Um, but I will say, you do have to be pretty brave to play this because uh, now the, the road to, to victory is actually pretty narrow. You, you take on e6, which seems obvious, but this move, rook, rook f6, is a, is a little bit scary. Um, you have to play queen h5, which again is obvious. You save the queen with check. King g8. And then actually the only move that wins here is rook e5. Rook e3 is no good because bishop d6 happens, and then you're down two pieces and can't play rook g3, and things get ugly. But rook e5 is good enough, and white comes to, to attack the king. For example, rook f7. Bishop h6, and you, you've seen these, these games before, I'm sure. Bishop f8, check. And in the long run, uh, black's king is just not going to survive. OK, probably not rook e8. I think I meant to play that move. But uh, you get the idea. So against g6, we have successfully stopped black's idea of coming uh, to defend with this bishop on g7. We stopped it just by taking all the pawns and then, and then checkmating the black king which is pretty good. Why not rook e5 instead of rook e6? Um, I think rook e5 is good. It's just not quite as good as rook e6, because black has rook f5 in this instance. And then your best move is to go rook e6. And I think black's best move is rook f6. And then you've transposed. Um, yeah, but rook f5 is the answer. So against g6, we have this really crazy idea, sacking all our pieces, ripping open the black king, and then playing for checkmate. Um, which is, again, a, an important motif to remember. Now, against h6, this is what was played in the game. So what do you think uh, our idea is going to be now? Now that we've induced h6, do any common attacking themes come to mind? <laughs> Manny says, one more move to time control. Yeah. It's a little bit risky to try these repetitions in a in crazy positions like that. You know, the odds that you miss something are, are kind of there. OK, everybody agrees. Everybody agrees. The amazing move, queen h5. And this was played in the game. But it is amazingly not the best move. I was just as shocked as you were. Um, Alpha0 says, what about knight takes e6? And uncharacteristically, I think Alpha0 has the wrong idea here. Um, this knight is helping us attack the king right now. And we can play something like queen h5 and preserve our knight in this square. And we would rather keep this knight later to, to sacrifice that at the correct opportunity. You know, this knight on g5 is very, very good. We don't necessarily want to give it up just yet. And taking e6 might actually ease black's problems a little bit by allowing this rook to step forward and, and help defend. Um, so amazingly, queen h5 is not the right idea. You know, I was very, very shocked. Mm. So what's wrong with queen h5? What's, what's the point? And I'm actually going to ask you guys at home this question, because I think it's a really, really nice idea. And it's one that shows up uh, not, uh, not rarely. It, sh it shows up quite a bit, actually. So we have this queen bearing down on the king side. We have pressure on the f7 pawn, and we have pressure on this diagonal. Uh, so black's next move is going to, to stop uh, our main threat here. So our main threat, as people in the chat are saying, is we want to go knight h7, and then as uh, Aaron is quoting, sack, sack, and mate. We, we take on h6, we go queen h6, and we, we just rip open the king's side and, and win. Although, OK, now I'm realizing Aaron was talking about the knight h7 line. Um, but yeah, knight h7 here is our main threat. Like, if black does nothing, uh, we go knight h7, we go bishop h6, we just take this guy, and we, we attack the king. With, with our knight on h7, with our bishop here, can bring in our rook. It's going to be very, very dangerous. So that's our threat. But black has actually a very clever, clever way to, to stop the threat. Uh, Manny has the right idea, but maybe in the wrong order. So work on that one a little bit more, Manny, and then I think you'll have, a, you'll have our answer. Uh, bishop f6 might actually make things worse. Uh, I'll look at bishop f6 really quickly, but if we go knight h7, move the rook, um, I might be mistaken. No, we don't have the same trick with going bishop g5, but uh, 
I think we could actually go bishop g5 first. I was thinking that the queen would be trapped here. Uh, but I think in this case, you can't actually capture this guy. But if we go bishop g5 first, I think I, I won't have any such problems. And you're in big, big danger. For example, takes takes. Um, g6, I'm always going to take it. And if you don't play g6, you know, I, I take here. And, and you're in trouble. And you're in trouble. So Manny has arrived at the right idea. Queen e8 is the miracle resource for black that's actually going to keep black in this game. Uh, after queen e8, it's, it's hard to continue moving forward with white. So what, what is the point? Well, the point is actually after knight h7, black is winning here with an amazing tactic. So if you haven't seen it yet, try, try to find it now. Um, but the answer, of course, is now we go f5, just completely locking this bishop out putting the queens in contact, and now threatening to capture the knight for free. And believe it or not, black is totally winning after knight h7, f5. Um, we have to trade the queens, otherwise our knight just dies. Um, OK, I mean, theoretically, we could go here, but we're, we're still just going to be down a piece. So we trade the queens, but now black can save the rook with tempo. Uh, and this knight is entirely trapped on the h7 square. R rook e6, king h7, bishop f5, king g8. And black has more pieces. You know, what, what, more, uh, what more is there to want? So queen e8 would have been a really stellar defensive resource to, to keep black in the game and actually make white's life uh, rather difficult. So with that in mind, is there a better move here than queen h5? Is there a better move here than queen h5? Subakura so says knight takes e6. Uh, again, this is going to make black's life easier. You know, it, you, you get a couple pawns, but black's rook is going to enter the game and help defend. And you've actually given the king uh, a better escape route than, than he once had. So knight e6 is no good. No good. Manny says knight f3. So actually, in this line with queen h5, queen e8, the best that white can do is, is actually retreat with this knight, either to, to f3 or I think h3. And then you know continue the attack a little bit more slowly. We're threatening stuff like this, threatening g4, g5 now, with, with a little bit more of a severe threat on the h6 pawn. g4, not good when all three pawns are here. But when the h6 pawn has been induced forward, we can sometimes use that as a hook to open things up. Um, but the point is, we can improve over queen h5 uh, by continuing on forward. And Webster actually has the right answer this time. It's knight h7 first, of course, just not allowing this queen e8 idea. So after rook e8, now we could continue with queen h5. And this, I think, would, would transpose to the, uh, the, game, the game line. Um, <clears throat> although I'm now realizing there's queen d5 here, what am I missing? I think maybe queen g4 in this instance is, is the idea. And against queen d5, we would now have bishop e4. Sorry. I think I mixed up my lines there. Yeah, it is queen, g, queen g4 here. And all the same threats that we've been talking about are going to be very, very strong. Um, so knight h7 first. And it might not seem that important whether you go queen h5 or knight h7, but it's always important to be aware of your opponent's defensive resources. And Sort of putting yourself in, their, yourself in their shoes. Like, you know, if I were black, how, how would I try to get out of this? And queen h5, queen e8 would actually give white a, a very difficult time forward here. Like, you have to find moves like knight h3 just retreating so that you can continue attacking later. Uh, of course, white is still going to be better after queen e8, but uh, you do have to retreat. Um, and of course, this queen e8 idea actually reminded me of a very famous game um, between Bobby Fischer and Benko, uh, which, if you guys know at home, Bobby's immortal rook f6 move uh, is the one I'm talking about. So be sure to look up that game if you, if you haven't seen it. Um, yeah, so queen e8, uh, as the in-person audience is coming back, who's also named Caleb, uh, knight h7, f5, and black is actually winning. Uh, as we were saying, this knight is completely trapped and takes takes. You, you can't get this knight out. Um, but queen e8, not found in the game. Queen h5, bishop d5 played. And this just does allow knight h7, rook e8. And then, of course, I, I sort of already spoiled it, but how do, we, how do we attack now? How can we break through? Yeah. 
looking at? Bishop h6, and black is, is getting, getting crushed here. Um, so after bishop h6, we get takes, takes, uh, f5 now, but it's sort of too little too late. We needed to interfere with this bishop, but of course, how is white going to continue now? Just rook e3. It's the, the moves sort of play themselves. This rook on e1 might not seem like it's doing a lot at first. I remember in the opening, we just played this random rook e1 move. But bringing the rook to the open file really allows all sorts of attacking opportunities as well. This is a very important attacking piece, even though it starts out on the first rank without looking like it's doing much, aside from pressuring maybe the e file. But rook e3 to g3 is going to be a deadly idea in a lot of these positions. Uh, Black went a little bit crazy now, played bishop takes h4. And it's time to find uh, some knockout punches here. Time to find some knockout punches. So uh, this is now a tactics puzzle for those of you at home. Um, how do we put the final nails in the coffin here for Ivan? Someone in the chat says knight f6. Knight f6 would be great, but it can be captured. Um, maybe like this. Yeah, maybe with the queen. And then, yeah. OK, Manny says queen g6 check, king h8, rook h3. Um, the only problem with that is you didn't make a threat. I'll play rook g8 and continue the game. And then I'll take on g2. And then I'll ask you if you're even still winning. Rook h3 first. OK, rook h3 might, might win, but uh, it's not nearly as fun as, uh, as the game continuation. <coughs> OK, so we can do everything with checks here. That's my hint. We can do everything with checks, aside from you know the end. Yeah, rook h3, uh, maybe black can play king to f7. And uh, you might be getting your piece back, but I don't know if you're checkmating me right away. Like rook takes h4, king e7, for example, and I'm a runner. I am a runner. There you go. Rook g3 check, the amazing deflection, getting rid of this bishop, and then... Um, then we're in business. So bishop takes g3. What's the follow-up? Uh, yeah. Knight f6. They come this way. So what do we do? Yeah, I mean, OK, not, not all checks, but here we go. Manny's got the right line. We go queen g6 first, stopping king f7, king h8, and then bam, knight f6 is, is going to be game over. Knight f6, and the point is, uh, if you try to defend, check, and mate. Same if you defend with the rook, or rook g8, or anything. Just too many threats here to stop. So you have to get really creative, um, or sacrifice the queen. In, this is actually the game line. And Ivan came up with the, the killer, bishop to h2 check, the move that nobody saw coming. Um, and of course, the point is, if you take, you're going to get checked. And then with two pieces defending along the rank, black is not yet checkmated. But white found the right idea here. You just move out of the way. And then, you know, not, nothing, nothing really happening for black. So black sacrifices the queen. And they played on for a while. But uh, black has all the same problems. We're going to go with check, check. And Ivan decided to resign now that he's losing a second rook. Um, white just very calmly plays rook h1 and moves the king out of the way. And all the attacking power is, is still there. So that was the, the nice uh, finish to the game here. Rook g3 check, amazing move, getting rid of the bishop. And then we have this nice checkmating pattern.
from before. So let's look at this start to finish and sort of talk about the key concepts here. Um, because it's nice to look at a game like this and just calculate, calculate, calculate. Um, but to actually take something away from it to incorporate in your games, it's useful to look at a lot of these attacking ideas, especially when there's no knight on f6. That should kind of be your first cue. Hey, maybe I can, can attack on the king's side here, because I have all these open diagonals. Black doesn't have the f6 knight to help defend against these ideas. Um, and it, it looks like black's king is a little bit lonely. So you, you notice that you might have some kind of attacking idea. And then you look for these common patterns, these common themes. Um, which now you have seen before. You look for ways to take on h7 or to pressure h7. Uh, you look for ways to induce weakness with either g6 or h6. And from this game, we actually learned quite a bit. We learned about um, this, uh, this pattern, which I mean, some of you might have seen before. Um, as someone in the chat mentioned, this is Bobby Fish Fisher's famous sack sack mate. This is what he's talking about. Um, like this knight h7 idea is, is really, really useful to, to just have in your arsenal. You know, against g6, when I can have this knight on g5, this is a sacrifice to look for, or a sacrifice to calculate. And against h6, now you know these ideas, queen h5, you know to look out for this queen e8 idea, because this does show up uh, quite often. And you know about knight h7, um, you know, revealing this bishop uh, behind the knight, allowing it to sacrifice. And you know about this rook lift as well. Like these are all. Uh, themes that are going to show up over and over again in positions like this, in positions where you're trying to attack the castled king. Uh, and so that's the point that I, I want you guys to take away. Even if you don't consciously memorize these ideas, uh, it's really useful to pay attention and notice when, when they're coming up in your games. Uh, and if you miss something like this in your games, uh, now you know to, to be on the lookout, because they show up, they're not uncommon, and they are great ways to, to win the game. You just attack in the middle game, you find all these great ideas, and, and you crush. But the, the subtle idea that I wouldn't expect people to find is h4 in this position. Realizing from such a tame looking position that you can play something like h4 and just launch into this uh, super tactical sequence where you're attacking the black king and, and winning with mate is, is hard to do. Uh, but it's all about looking for those key signs. The knight on f6 is missing. We have long open diagonals. Our center is very secure, thanks to this knight takes c3 business. Um, and so why not go for an attack? Uh, probably knight a5 was not good. Maybe bishop f6 was more useful. Yeah, again, the, the best move that I've seen played here, I, I did a little bit of analysis. It was this queen d5 move by, by Jan Timmen that was played against uh, uh, Vichy and Anand. And the idea is very simple. You centralize the queen. You increase some, some threats against uh, White's king, and you just have too much counterplay to go for the same kinds of attacks uh, that we were looking at before. Um, so queen d5, and if you want to look at that game, you can look at that game. But you know, obviously, if black plays well, then he doesn't lose by checkmate. So uh, black has to make some mistake in the game. And knight, knight to a5 is one of those, as well as not playing queen e8 here was, was the real end of the game. That's when white was just totally winning. Um, but super fun game. OK, so any questions from the audience here? Any questions on this game? Isn't queen d5 running into bishop e4? Uh, maybe. Let's look. Uh, so bishop e4, maybe black is uh, you know, coming in to defend a little bit. Something like queen h5 tries to highlight that this h4 pawn might be a little bit weak. And it's very different from when the queen ended up on h4 because white has all these pieces in the way. Black still has this dark square bishop, and, uh, and life is good. I might also be missing some other tactical justification, but I, I think something like queen h5 is, is going to be useful for black. Um, just as an example line, queen h5, uh, knight g5, I, I can take. And tactically, this shouldn't work for you, because too many threats. Um, and if you just take back, I'll take the knight. and. Uh, same sort of deal. Black is surviving. Mm -mm. Uh, could black not take h4? I would suggest you go back in the lecture a little bit. We talked about uh, bishop h4 when we first looked at this move. Um, OK, let's move on to another game. So that was one example of <laughs> a, a crushing kingside attack with uh, an isolated queen pawn, which is one type of position, but of course, not all games are, are going to be the same. 
And while this is a common attacking structure for white, it's definitely not the only one. So I wanted to look at something sort of radically different. Now I go over a lot of D4 games in my lectures, because that's what I like to play. But uh, we're going to look at a game between uh, two Alexanders, Alexander Toulouse and Alexander Kotov, two super strong Russians from back in the mid-1900s, I think. I think Toulouse was uh, a, a coach or something for Boris Spassky way back in the day. So these guys knew their stuff. And here we're going to be looking at a Sicilian. So we get e4, c5, knight f3, e6, d4, take, take, knight f6, knight c3, d6, and just g3 uh, by Alexander Kluge. Excuse me. <coughs> just g3. So white is taking maybe a more conservative approach compared to the main line with g4, where you are going for this garbage right out of the opening. Instead, white is going to develop first with g3. Uh, we get knight c6, and we're in a Scheveningen, by the way. Uh, bishop g2, which is calmly fianchettoing. Bishop d7. Uh, and then white plays this kind of cagey move, knight d to e2. So what's the point of this move? Well, the point is black would likely uh, appreciate bringing this bishop out to c6. And if you do something like castles, uh, maybe one day knight takes d4, and bishop c6 is going to come. So white instead plays knight d to e2 to keep these pieces on the board, make black's life a little bit harder with the lack of space to put these pieces on comfortable squares. Definitely not the main, main idea in the opening, though. Just kind of a cagey. Uh, I, maybe it was a novelty at the time, maybe not. Just a cagey idea to make black's life a little bit harder. Uh, a6 played in the game. We get castles, b5. White plays this move a3, just trying to slow down black's b4 counterplay. And now we get queen to c7. So once again, we have uh, just sort of a random chess position out of the opening. Uh, so the question is now, you know, judging by the topic of the class, you might have an idea of what we're going to be doing. But how do we organize our pieces? What kind of ideas are, are we going for in this instance? Because it's a very, very different kind of position. And it's going to be a very different kind of attack from an isolated queen pawn position, because the structure is just totally different. Black hasn't even castled yet. Um, and so we have to definitely play, play a lot differently. And while you're thinking, Daniel has a question. He says, do you always calculate concretely when you do a sacrifice, or can you simply decide based on intuition? Um, well, it depends. If you're playing in a tournament game and you have time on your clock, you should calculate concretely. If you're playing in a tournament game and you don't have time on your clock, um, sometimes intuition has to be enough. But when in doubt, when given the choice between calculating and not calculating, you should always calculate. It's, it's basically cheating, calculating. You just get to know the truth of the position if you do it correctly instead of guessing. OK, so there's some ideas in the chat. Uh, Volodymyr says we have to decide what to do with the dark squared bishop. And that's not necessarily true. Um, you saw it in the last game as well, actually. But oftentimes, star squared bishop is the last piece to get developed. And that's for good reason, because we don't actually know where we want it yet. We haven't decided. Maybe it's good on e3. Maybe it'll want to come out and sacrifice on h6, like in last game. Maybe it'll come to g5, maybe even to f4 if this uh, diagonal opens up. And maybe somewhere else, maybe b4, bishop b2, or something crazy. So we don't really know what to do with this bishop yet. So a lot of times, it's better just to leave it on c1. It's out of the way. It's not going to get harassed by black's pieces. And once you know where it belongs, then you can move it. Um, some other ideas in the chat were f4. This is definitely going to be uh, a common theme here. h3 has been suggested as well. And then yeah, bishop b3, bishop f4 also suggested uh, in this position. Um, so I really do like leaving this bishop on c1 for the moment, because once you decide on a square, then black sort of knows what you're up to and can adapt his play based on, on where you move to. Um, but yeah, I like this move h3 to start. This is actually what's played in the game. And after bishop e7, I really like uh, white's next move. Um, it's, I, I always joke, it's the quintessential Karpovian move in these positions when 
you want to attack soon, but you need to play a super good improving move first. What do you do? Of course, you play king h1, just sidestepping all of the stuff and slowly but surely getting ready to play stuff like f4. You don't want to do this too early because then you just open up your king to all sorts of uh, nasty counterattacking ideas. Uh, some of the chat says king h2. So why wouldn't we want to go to king h2? Well, we might want to move this pawn as well. And then same exact thing. We don't want our king on this open diagonal. So king h1 castles. And then white actually starts with this nice move g4. And this move next to e2 is starting to make a little bit more sense. So g4. And white's attacking setup now is actually going to revolve around bringing this knight to g3 and using this knight to help support both the center and some nice attacking ideas. You, got, you all know about knights landing on f5. Knights landing on h5 can also be pretty dangerous as well, attacking the king. And so after king h8, we get knight g3. Um, OK, b4 played in the game for black, trying to go for counterplay. White captures, black captures. And now it's up to us to, again, decide how we're going to continue uh, our attack here. So rather than the last game, which we saw the attack kind of being led by pieces, in this instance, there's something different. Uh, this knight is still on f6. And believe it or not, that one knight makes all, all the difference. You know, it guards this square, it guards this square, and it makes it very difficult for white to just sort of come in and, and attack like we saw last time. White's pieces are also not quite as well placed as we saw last time, right? This bishop is going to have a hard time attacking this king side. It's, it's aiming this way instead. So because of all that, because white doesn't have these super active pieces, sometimes it's better to lead with the pawns. OK, the chat says f4. I think f4 is probably just as good. But white actually starts with g5, because why not start with g5? You kick this knight out of the way. By the way, this is the reason why king h8 was played. Black wants to bring this knight to g8 rather than e8 to help defend uh, some of these squares. Uh, so knight g8 played, and then yes, uh, f4 is, is the follow-up in the game. So knight g8, f4, bishop c6. OK, so we've played g5, we've played f4. Now again, how are we continuing our attack? Is it time to bring in the pieces? Is it time to continue with the pawns? What do we want to do? Joey asks, doesn't e5 win material? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think e5, you're going to run into knight d5. And black's doing OK. Daryl asks, can you ask what justifies such an attack with an open center and light squared bishops and queens still on the board? It's just that white played bishop g2 early. Um, yeah, so some of it is white can get away with pushing these pawns because this bishop is a great defender of the king. Um, outside of that, white can get away with pushing these pawns because the center is actually not open. Um, an open center is, that would be if these three pawns were gone, and then this would be psychotic. These three pawns are here. It's sort of semi-open. It's still a fluid center. It's you know, subject to change. Um, so it might open up, but white might be able to keep it closed and might keep things under control. Um, and the justification is that black has less space. You know, when you have more space, you, you can attack more, more often than not. And so because white has all this space and white uh, decided that black couldn't open the center in time, uh, that's what allows him to go for this kind of attack on, on the king's side. Now, Judging the specifics of that are always going to be difficult, and it's, it's going to be a very concrete thing. That's why you know, uh, platitudes like when your opponent attacks on the flank, counter in the center, don't always get you far in chess. You have to look at the specifics, see, well, is the attack on the flank uh, coming faster than the attack in the center, or is the attack in the center going to be worthwhile? Um, but that's the justification, is white has more space, uh, the center isn't open yet, and white's attack is coming quickly. OK, the chat is all better than Alexander Toulouse. f5 is the best move. And I think that this is the, the natural idea, the natural continuation for, for white in this position. Uh, now, why didn't white play f5? Well, probably white was looking at uh, this pawn coming to d5 and maybe didn't like something about this where uh, we can no longer keep things closed with something like e5. For example, let's compare what 
Uh, let's compare that line to in the game. Uh, in the game, white plays this weird looking move, knight c to e2. Once again, two weird knight retreats. But against this, I think white would be very, very happy to play something like e5 here, keep the center closed, and then slowly ratchet up the pressure on the king's side while occupying this d4 outpost. So I, I think this d5 move was the reason why uh, black shied away from f5, because f5, d5, it does turn out that uh, you're in time to do stuff like knight h5 and attack. But let's say you play like one slow move, something like queen g4. I think uh, d takes e4, and now you, you do start to regret all these pawn pushes that you've made. Because if the center does fully open up, like uh, Daryl in the chat was asking, then you, you can run into some trouble here with, with white. You definitely can run into trouble. Um, queen g4 might also hang this pawn, by the way. But I think this is more, more relevant, at least to start with. Knight c2 might also be included. Um, but yeah, it turns out you can play knight h5, and uh, stuff like f6 is, is coming way too quickly. Uh, and you're going to end up in some position like this, where this knight is sort of entirely entombed, and black is in a lot of trouble. Uh, black might not be getting checkmated right away, because this knight, while entombed, does defend the h6 square. But having an entombed knight probably means that black is going to lose this game. Um, so I think f5 is correct, but you have to be aware of these counter punches. You have to be aware of d5, have to be aware of what black is, is up to. Um, instead, knight d to e2 is played. Um, black comes up with this nice move, bishop to b5. And then white has this really nice idea to both activate this bishop and defend c2. Uh, and he does so by playing bishop to d2. If you don't play bishop to d2, I think white is, is actually going to be worse in this position. Because it is very risky to push all these pawns, and black is, is getting active. Uh, so bishop to d2, how does this defend c2? Well, if you take with the knight, rook to c1 is going to be strong. And if you take with the queen, that hangs the knight. So simple enough. Black continues now with d5, but we can see that uh, white is a lot better prepared for it now. The dark squared, or black's light squared bishop is no longer on this diagonal, and he can continue now with, with bishop to c3, fully activating this bishop on this diagonal. Once again, useful to wait with that bishop. Now, now we know this is the critical diagonal in the game. This is the soft spot in black's camp, and so bishop to, to c3 is where this bishop belongs. Uh, we get d takes e4 in the game. And now, once again, how are we going to continue here? How do we crack uh, Black's castle? Yeah, knight h5 is great. Knight h5 is great. And there's really only one move that doesn't hang a piece, or g7, and that is f6. So what, what's the points? Now what is the points? Queen d4, again, queen d4, like in the last game, isn't going to be as good, because the queen is actually pretty well placed on d1 uh, to come into the, the king's side and continue the attack, uh, much more so than it would be on d4. I think you're also running into an e5 idea if you play queen d4. That's why it's not winning a piece. Um, yeah, I was just saying, I think you run into this e5 idea as well. And, and the queen is better placed on d1. Um, but I understand that this just looks like a fork. But I think e5 is, is going to be saving the day. Uh, and something like this is, is going to be getting active once again for, for black. I'm actually going to check this, though, because I might be wrong. And I didn't see this idea. Yeah, e, e5 is, is saving the day for, for black. Um, and if take. Okay, not bishop c5 is fine, but knight c2 is, is even better. Just really rubbing it in that you can't jump over your own pieces. What did the computer want instead of f5? Uh, just queen e4, and now you play this position, um, which is fine. I think this it's at equality here or something. Uh, white's slightly better, but yeah. Uh, definitely not the, the crushing ideas that we're looking for. <coughs> Sorry, so we had knight h5. Uh, f6. And then, yeah, Subakura has, has the right idea. We just take that g7 pawn off the board. Just come right after uh, black's king. So knight g7. And I will admit that, I, to me, this idea seems a lot less common than the ideas we looked at in the previous game. But it's important to notice, like, 
whenever things seem to be getting locked up with the pawns, the, the common theme is always going to be some kind of sacrifice uh, on the pawns is needed to fully rip it open unless you just have sort of a free attack. Um, so knight g7 is the idea here. We found the soft spot in black's camp with our bishop and our knight working together, and then we just sacrifice to, to, to finish opening it up. Um, in this position, amazingly, black is actually not busted, but he has to find rook d8. When after knight e6, rook d1, knight c7, um, you can take this piece, and uh, these lines are sort of confusing, but equality, just according to the computer, equality. So, so there you go. Um, but barring that, uh, black tried to play this move. Uh, bishop takes e2. And the reason for that is if you play king takes g7, knight d4 is going to be the idea when this is a threat and this is a threat and you can't really stop everything. So black's solution was to take the knight off the board. But unfortunately, this does just lose after queen e2, uh, king to g7. Once again, how do we bring in the pieces? How do we bring in the pieces now? Yeah, just, just queen h5 and bishop e4 to come. Actually, OK, bishop e4 played first. In this case, it, it shouldn't matter. Um, OK, actually, it might matter. Maybe if you go queen h5 first, uh, black is going to try to defend this pawn. So bishop e4 first, and then we come with queen h5. And black just doesn't have time to eliminate this bishop because of checkmating threats. In the game, rook d8 was tried to give the king a flight square. Uh, but now we just go rook g1 and finish opening, opening things up over here. Bishop c5, but white doesn't even care. Just take on f6, double check. And now, white to move and win. Uh, as we're a couple minutes over time here, let's wrap it up. White to move and win, anybody? Can you be the hero to, uh, to put black out of his misery? Yeah, something tells you rook g8, and that would be the correct answer. But why is that the answer? What do we have here? Sack more. That's right. <laughs> they didn't tell you the follow up. They just told you rook g8. Yeah. So it's actually a really, really nice idea here. Yeah, just bishop h7. And if queen takes, f7. And the king cannot stay in contact with the queen. And if the queen takes, we have checkmate. Nasty business, nasty business. So king f8 was played in the game. And this game does last a little while longer, but the result is no longer in doubt. And white can do a number of things and still win. Uh, namely, take all the pieces with check is normally good enough. So check, check, check. Takes this piece. Check, 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 check. And black resigns. This is hanging. It's also like just checkmate in, in a few here. And that, that's the end of the game. So just another example of how attacks can, can sort of come together. You know, you look for weak spots in the camp, in your enemy's camp, and you try and find uh, common themes, common sacrificial ideas, uh, non-sacrificial ideas to, to break things open. You know, not everything has to be a sacrifice. For example, in this game, just the simple f5, f6, I think, was, was the correct way to go about things. Uh, what white did does allow some opportunities for, for black to fight back with, you know, even still d5, and we saw some crazy lines where, where black is equalizing. So the point of this lecture was to show you guys all these fun attacking themes, attacking ideas, and talk a little bit about what to look for in your games. You know, you, you've got to be uh, vigilant. You've got to be looking for these ideas. Otherwise, they will, they will pass you by in sometimes seemingly you know, in innocuous positions. Uh, with that, I think I'm going to wrap up the Road to 2000 for tonight. We should have Grandmaster Atanas Kolev coming in shortly with uh, insane in the end game, I believe. It's time to get insane. So stick around for that. As always, thank you all very much for watching. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.